Hello and welcome to We've Got Worm, a Daily Planet Films podcast series where we expertly dissect and discuss the hit web serial Worm week by week, arc by arc. My name is Matt Freeman, your host and proud holder of a PhD in the parahumanities. As always, I'm joined by my co-host, Scott Daly, who holds an honorary associate's degree in knowing how to read. Scott, how's it going today? I'm doing pretty good, Matt, uh, besides that very, very mean uh, comparison between the two of us. <laughs> but, That's great. Um, I think the the point there is that you know Worm and I don't, and that's what this podcast is. is a first me, a first time reader reading through it. So if you're listening to this for the first time, uh, you should probably go back and read the first one, but um, or listen to the first one. But but that's what we do here. We uh we go through it step by step. You guide me through this this uh excellent book. Yes, without spoiling anything, which is increasingly difficult. Yeah, yeah. Um, and this week we are doing Arc Five Hive. And Matt, this is a good one. I really like this one. Yeah, things are really picking up. I uh, I don't know what what act we would be in based on our our act structure guideline, but we're 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 things are moving quickly and, and escalating quite a bit at this point. We've yeah. got some really cool uh, superhero battles here, or supervillain battles, I should say. Yeah, and that's uh, you know it, it, it's funny because like each one of these arcs is its own kind of novella. Um, so each has like a setup and then the building of tension and then a climax and then uh, a resolution. Like each, each one is its own arc. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Right. So it, it works really well. And there's some parallelism in this arc, I think, where, um, there's, there's, there are two meetings in this chapter, uh, in this, in this arc, I mean, and both of them are very dramatically interesting meetings between kind of rival parties, but have completely different stakes and, and sort of opposite outcomes in a certain sense. And um, it's, it's just interesting how we're watching Taylor's personal life and, and Cape life evolve in parallel, but in very different ways, but also using similar uh, devices. Yeah. It's kind of cool how it's um, these two lives are coming together but they're also very separate from each other at the same time. Um, yep. And, and we'll definitely be seeing that throughout this entire arc and probably throughout the rest of the book. Yeah. All right. Um, so let's get into discussion questions, if that's okay, Scott. Um, yeah. So, so it's getting to the point we're getting so many Reddit comments that, that I'm, I'm having to really triage and, and just pick a few to discuss every week because otherwise this would be a 45 minutes of discussing Reddit comments. and. <laughs> Um, so, uh, and also I wanted to comment, I'll probably put this in the post that it would be cool if we could switch back to using the black bar spoiler tags so that Scott can look at the, that the Reddit thread, just cause I think that'd be more enjoyable for everyone. I don't think it would really diminish anyone's enjoyment. So yeah, uh, we can try that. That'd be cool. Yeah. And, and, um, you know, I, I miss, <laughs> I miss getting into those and reading cause you send me some of these comments and I kind of like, for those of you listening, what the way Matt does this is he like he like goes through the comments, pulls out the ones that are spoilers and, and then uh, messages me with the rest of them. So I like see these things. And I'm like, Oh, I want to respond to this. Uh, but <laughs> I'm afraid to go into the subreddit. So I could participate yeah. in the conversation. And then something else that occurred to me is, you know, we do, we do have people that are listening along um, that have not read it either that are doing exactly what I'm doing, but listening along. I know, I know for sure we have a few of those at least, and hopefully we get more of them as we go. So it would be good if the Reddit thread could just be a place where everyone comes to talk about it and not just the people who already know what's going to happen. So, yeah. Yeah. On that note, I know we had an influx of new worm readers this week from some obscure internet thing. I'm not too uh, clear on what it is exactly, but that's, that's yeah. how the internet works. I still don't so. know what that was, but yeah, the subreddit has gotten uh, crazy and, and, <laughs> and there's a lot of, there's definitely a lot of new, uh, new people in it. Um, and Matt, we had a really good week too, as far as our numbers. Um, so I know some of them at least checked us out. So that's really yeah. cool. Yep, definitely. All right. So moving into the comments, uh, several people mentioned that they kind of were with me in, in that the first time they read through the previous arc, they didn't quite see Bakuda's arrival as the tonal shift that um, that I kind of feel like I saw the second time through. And I, and I can definitely speak to that. I think a lot of that has to do with the insane pace that I and many people read this story. Um, it's, it's, it's one reason why I'm appreciating listening to the Worm audiobook 
uh, this time through because it actually forces me to slow down and pay attention to what's happening. Um, because when I read at my own pace, I, I don't quite skim, but I do miss a lot. And I, I actually blame myself because if you see something the second time through, it means it was there and you just weren't paying attention. Um, and S. Robinson 62 uh, compares the arrival of Bakara and the murder of the um, poor innocent um, not really gang member to the death of, spoiler, Cedric Diggory in Harry Potter, um, because that also marks a very sharp transition to a new phase of, of that story and a new tone. Yeah, I really, I really like that comparison because um, that's that's very accurate. Um, that was so much moving from the, you know your childhood boarding school adventure into this deeper, darker, more adult story. This is not quite starting from the same place. I think the story was always meant for for uh, adults, but the, the the tone of the story definitely did change. Mm -hmm. Yep. Uh, Tank it for cost. Tank it for cost. Uh, comments on our discussion of the fact that each character's power and personality is inherently tied to the nature and details of their trigger event. And uh, just thought that was a, a good observation and worth uh, fleshing out. And I, I think we definitely will have plenty of occasion to flesh that out. Yeah, absolutely. I think the more we learn about these, these trigger events, um, did you say someone made fun of me for calling it a triggering event? I think you, you sent that to I think me. That was in there. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Sorry yeah. guys. <laughs> yeah. Internet lingo You're, has me pretty programmed. Yeah. You were triggered, Scott. I was. I was. Yeah. Uh, the Blue Bloom would like to see more speculation on possible uses of powers. And I obviously enjoy doing this in my own head while I'm reading and not reading. So I'm sure between us we can come up with some funny things or some fun things, rather. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, I think the coolest thing that I say the coolest thing, like to every single thing we talk about this, but one of the coolest things the story does is how inventive it is as far as power use. So. Us participating in that would be fun. Yep. Um, you, on, on the YouTube comments, Thomas takes me to task for explaining Uber's power poorly and, in fact, probably just having it wrong in my head entirely. Uh, so what I was saying is that he, he can gain skill in, in tasks really quickly. That's apparently wrong. Um, what he does is if he's focusing on a particular task or skill, he will become world class at it really quickly. But then as soon as he stops focusing on it, he loses that skill. So and he can only focus on one thing at a time, which is why you see this blend of clumsiness and grace. And uh, that's that makes perfect sense. I, I uh, not entirely sure why I had that misapprehension, but I was plain, plain wrong there. Yeah, that makes a lot more sense to me, too. I was having trouble like I, some some of these powers. I have trouble figuring out exactly what it is. Um, and that's I, I that's on me. But um, that that really helps me understand it a little bit better. Yeah. And uh, that that same user goes on to talk about how uh, Rachel was harsh with that mom and daughter, but also has a point. Um, and I think that's. That's interesting. It's because we we see this kind of dynamic happening a lot in Worm, where uh, and I think I think Scott, you you were the one who who pointed out later in the story how the ends justify the means uh, becomes a uh, a theme pretty strongly here. And it's like, well, okay, yeah, Rachel probably did keep that uh, stop that mom from ever letting her daughter get close to a a dog that she didn't know. Um, but were the uh, were the means quite quite necessary to achieve that? Right. And I think this is an extremely timely comment, considering how much in this arc we learn about Rachel and why she is the way she is. And th this like this was a really good example of the fact that Rachel has a lot of good motives behind the thing she does. But just the execution of it is not great. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And finally, on YouTube, user Matthew points out that uh, Waldo gave a Magneto like power to a Nazi, uh, which is. Kind of a funny comparison, um, although well, I, I think as we'll see in this arc, the way Kaiser uses his power is not really that close to Magneto's power after all, other than the fact that it involves metal. Um, yeah, yeah. It's funny that like the name Kaiser didn't <laughs> didn't occur to me until I thought about it. And I was like, hey, wait a minute. Yeah. And then, of course, right. his wife's I think her name is Purity, right? Purity. Yeah, yeah, Purity. And she's and she's radiant white. Yeah. yeah. Oh, man. Yeah, and I mean, I think all the, I think they almost all have some kind of um, uh, white power theme to their to their superhero name. Yeah, yeah. Mostly, anyway. 
So uh, let's move on into the arc by arc or the chapter by chapter discussion. All right. So 5.1. The various supervillain gangs of Brockton Bay meet for a detente at a dive bar called Somers Rock. Empire 88, the Undersiders, Coil, the Merchants, the mercenary group known only as Fault Lines Crew, and the just passing through travelers attend. The ABB is excluded because the topic of discussion is making common cause against the ABB. Um, so Scott, what what do you think about this this meeting where we where we meet so many characters and there's so much characterization done so quickly? Yeah, th this this whole chapter was kind of overwhelming to me because there's just so many different people, so many different names, so many different just descriptions um, that. You know, I I probably missed half of it. The remarkable thing is a lot of the people you meet in here are later clarified later in the arc. So there's people that we met here that I didn't really understand who they were until later. But yeah, this is this was super overwhelming. Um, but I think the result of that is like we just see the world like explode in size, right? Like there's now a bar where all these bad guys hang out at and there's a, a deaf bartender who serves them all. So like she can't overhear their nefarious plans. Um, it, I, I like it, it was overwhelming to me, but not in a bad way, I guess. Yeah, I, I know what you mean. I, I think, I think there's actually a, a method to the madness because I, I mean, my, I don't know, belief, which is founded on just, Conjecture is that Wildbo was probably making sure to mention all these characters once in a in a non combat setting before you see them in combat later, so that they're primed in your head and it's just almost just like a sketch for you to hang that that personality on later. And I don't think he necessarily expects you to remember what all their costumes look like from you know from from these descriptions, especially when they're all described so so close together. Um, yeah. Yeah, but and Matt, also, sorry, go ahead. So, so if let's just let's just do play a little game of hypothetical for a minute here. Let's just okay. say hypothetically, you're a superhero mm -hmm. who is hypothetically pretending to be a supervillain to infiltrate a group of supervillains in order to find out who's leading, who's the big boss of the supervillains. Mm -hmm. um, wouldn't you say, again, hypothetically, that mm -hmm. a meeting in which every single supervillain in the entire city is taking place at? would be a great time to trigger operation let's arrest all the bad guys and send them to jail oh scott i mean it's so complex <laughs> i mean to you me know, to, to me this is just this is a perfect moment look at all these bad guys they're all in one room just send a message to arms master you know as as taylor explains later in the chapter she's adding a lot of caveats and complications to her plan and and if she did it now then none of none of them would be met and um also i don't know if there's enough firepower in, in brockton bay on the superhero side to actually take down this meeting but uh yeah i mean that's that's that is the other fact that you know there's so many incredibly powerful people in one room it's kind yeah. of crazy i think even taylor comments on it yeah i actually thought you were going to ask who would win in a free-for-all if, if it just broke out into combat in this room and uh, <laughs> i don't think anyone would win yeah, I think everyone would probably die. That's true. Um, well, no, I, actually, I know. I, I think I know who would who would survive at least. But um, anyway, I'm gonna, you I'm gonna hold you that and your to my spoiler chest. hints. Well, no, it's it's not a spoiler. It's just it's just I'm thinking the one with the most durability would survive, and because a lot of these guys are glass cannons, like like Kaiser, yeah, is pretty strong. Except is just has like a flesh body like everyone else. So, anyways. Yeah. Moving on. Um, oh yeah, another comment about this is is this is another reason I'm enjoying the warm audio book is is I can with somebody else reading I can actually follow what's happening instead of being tripped up by my own over eager brain reading too quickly and missing things. Right. Yes. Yeah, sometimes you get to a speed that's just so fast that you're not actually reading every word. You're just reading right. every other word, and when they're dumping this much uh, detailed information on you, yeah, that's I mean that's probably what happened the first time around for me. Yeah. Uh, somewhere in here, pretty quickly, in, the, in terms of the chapter, we find out that the the supervillain named Skitter has actually stuck. Um, so it wasn't clear prior to this point when uh, I think it was Gallant came up with it that it would stick. Did you think it would stick the first time we heard it? Um, well, I kind of cheated with this because I I was on the subreddit enough to see so many like 
uh, posts titled Skitter or had the word Skitter in it that it got to the point where I was like, okay, this is going to be her name. Um, but I, I think, I think it's really like, again, the thing that we come to over and over again with this book is it's very, um, it's very good at using every little bit of information and to say something about the characters. So, you know, the fact that she got the skitter name now at this moment that she finally give, gave herself or, or took upon this name now when, um, when this this pers this alternate personality is becoming more and more prevalent in her life now it finally has a name is like thematically like perfect um yeah. i really liked it um yeah I, I was kind of surprised at first that she would let that identity be put on her but that's kind of um that's kind of what taylor does right she she lets people have have uh, this these opinions of her and and her saying fine whatever kind of shows a little growth there too. It's like I you can identify me by and identify me by that. That's fine. I don't care. Yeah. I know who yeah. I am, so right. you can call me whoever you want to be. Yeah. Um, on kind of on the flip side though, she she accepts Skitter, which is kind of like demeaning and creepy. Whereas like if you were if you were a supervillain and you were going to be a a bug supervillain, you would be like Scourge or Swarm or something, you know, more like I, maybe those were taken. I don't know. But the point is, like, you would try to be something terrifying. And Skitter, although her powers are terrifying, it's not a terrifying name. Um, and, and but she she kind of lets it happen. And uh, yeah, it, it must suck to not pick your your super name and have it be something kind of lame. But uh, like you said, it, it does, I guess it does denote a bit of growth there, too. And part of me thinks that she, she's just rationalizing it to herself that when she goes good, um, she'll just pick a new name and everything will be fine. She'll rebrand yeah. herself and all that stuff. So, yeah, yeah, I think you're right. Um, so we we actually uh, just in terms of the the meet the uh, the supervillains being introduced, we see a lot of the first monstrous pair of humans in Fault Lines crew. There's who we later find out is Gregor the Snail and, and Neuter, and they both look very unusual to the extent that they would essentially it would be impossible for them to blend in in normal society and, and you know, look and just, just pass as normal people. Um, so, Scott, prior to this point, did you have any inkling that there might be monstrous parahumans? You know, no, not at all. And, and I guess I shouldn't have been surprised because, like, you know, X-Men has the mutants that, like the mutation affects them physically and they look different. Um, a lot of other superhero stories have these class of, uh, of superheroes and supervillains. So I shouldn't have been surprised. Um, but I, I kind of was. And, but I think I, it, it does make a lot of sense, especially how it is presented here. Um, you know, we've talked over and over again about these themes of like consequences and, and, and actions having consequences. And, you know, so far, the consequences have only been you do something, here are the consequences for you. Taylor's consequences, the heroes and villains, um, just the overall consequences of people having these powers in the world. But this is like the first indication of there are consequences of the powers themselves, that just the powers existing themselves, not how they are used, has a direct consequence. And that leads into kind of, this is like a, a preview for the major theme of this whole arc, which is exploring how these powers affect people. Um, yeah. And I thought that was a really cool way to do it. Yeah. I would say that that's, that's a great point that that is kind of the theme of this arc that, that it's not just that you use the power, the power kind of uses you a bit. Mm -hmm. So, um, so when the merchants arrive, everyone openly uh, disrespects them and won't even let them sit at the main table. And it seems pretty clear that they're scum and also probably heavily outclassed powers wise and the fact that they kind of take the abuse is further evidence that uh they know they know where they stand um even grew talks down to them which is kind of funny because the undersiders don't really uh have a whole lot of strength and and control at this point i mean they've, they've made a few good jobs but i thought it was funny that grew was, was acting that way um, the, the travelers are, are, are an odd assortment. I'm not going to go into those too much right now. We'll see a bit of them later. Um, uh, but what we do know about them is that they're not really natives to Brockton Bay. They're passing through and Coyle, who we know very little about. We don't know what his powers are. We know that he just, um, sees himself as a chess master and his 
power probably has something to do with with that. And he, he has a lot of mercenaries under his control. He seems to be leading the meeting. I think he was the one who called the meeting. And Kaiser is characteristically trying to take control of the meeting passive aggressively. Um, so it's, it's, it's fun. It's a fun dialogue chapter. There's a lot of fun uh, conflict, verbal conflict between these people. And uh, it ends with them agreeing to focus on a truce to take down the ABB. Uh, however, 5.2 begins and the truce basically lasts for five seconds because Hook Wolf <laughs> uh, pipes up with a complaint about Rachel. And uh, so just as an aside about Hook Wolf, to my mind, he's clearly being characterized as a mad dog villain, like a, kind of the unpredictable, um, not like Kaiser, where Kaiser is kind of highly rational. If psychopathic, uh, uh, Hook Wolf is, is just a kind of a violent nut whose power is mainly just cutting people. Um, and it's funny slash interesting slash fitting that he takes umbrage with, with, with uh, Rachel of all people who is also kind of a, a mad dog in, in, in her own way. And it turns out that it was, it was his dog fighting den that she, that she destroyed uh, in the last interlude. And he wants some form of rest, restitution. Um, so the undersiders have to, beg their way out of the situation and basically say, okay, we'll, we'll, we'll settle this later because we can't, we can't really answer to this right now. Um, and, sh and basically after smoothing things over, the undersiders leave. And when they're out of sight of everyone, Brian sort of physically dominates and he's just like chokes and, and is really violent toward Rachel and, and chastises her for letting the team down. Um, and it, it's interesting because we're we're sort of being continually told through the narration and being in Taylor's head that we should like Brian. Um, and it causes us to kind of take it at face value when he says things like, I hate it that I hate it that I have to do this. I hate it that you only listen when I do, when, when I do this. But it's like, hey, man, you're the one who's choking the woman <laughs> against the wall. Um, yeah. How do you feel about this uh, violence from uh, from Brian here? Yeah, this is this is like first of all this is all crazy that like you know this is um a group of criminals and uh Brian is upset because um they lost footing because there's this weird sense of like rules and understandings between these criminal organizations and like this this weird like posturing and power struggle that exists between all these people um so it, it, that's all very strange considering these are like being a super villain supposed to be freeing but they seem to have just as many rules as everyone else um but this this kind of shocked me at first Brian's reaction to it and i th i think you you're absolutely right that i mean he's blaming her that he has to do these things but then like you know i i got started thinking about it and it's funny that this is again really clever setup for things that are going to be discussed about Rachel later on in the chapter. How like Brian is talking to her as if she's a dog. Um, right. Like he literally says, "Look me in the eyes," and that's like when we when I, we took my dog to to training. Like one of the first things the the training person taught us was you know teach the dog to look you in the eyes when you're giving it commands because that's how you know you have its attention. Um, mm -hmm. And that's that like that's that's how he's treating her like because you, you can't reason with a dog. Right. You can't like explain this is why you did bad here. Um, it has to be, you know, physical or verbal kind of punishment. And mm -hmm. Brian does both of those things to her. Um, and it, it seems like and we learn way more about this later in the chapter. But as I was reading as right now, it seems like. Rachel's kind of in a cycle where she behaves animalistically. So people treat her that way. And since people treat her that way, she behaves that way. And it just like, it keeps going. Um, yeah. and that's, that's, it's a little sad and it's a yeah. little disturbing to see Brian, like justify his actions that way. Right. It, it is interesting because we, we know that Brian has not actually figured out what's wrong with Rachel, which is what we're going to find out later. Right. But he has learned through trial and error how to deal with her. And like you say, it's basically talk to her like she's a dog. Yeah. Um, and then Tattletail, after he's done, makes a run at trying to communicate with her and just tries to emphasize that both of the recent issues, this one that just happened and the one involving the locker of money and the Bakuda situation, 
um, were caused by Rachel's failure to communicate with the team and that things would go a lot smoother if she would just work on that, which is which is her way of addressing uh, the issue that Rachel's having in a very oblique way. And she's treating her like a person, right? She's, yeah. she's not, she's like, look, we know you're going to do the things you need to do. We're not telling you that you're being bad. We're just saying we need you to talk to us. And she's doing it in a way that treats her like a human being. And right. that seems to have more of an effect. So, um, you know, it's, it's this, it's this thing where like, he started treating her that way because that was the way that was working, but maybe they, he just needs to try harder. And like, of course, what we learn is that that Tattletale has a very specific knowledge of exactly what is going on with Rachel. So she knows how to handle her better than he would. So I'm not I'm not fully throwing the blame on him. But um, this is like, you know, we're going to see this a lot. This this entire arc, like there's all these little bits and points of setup that pay off so well at the end of this chapter um, that I just loved. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I wanted to just read kind of a long segment when you consider how short we usually read, but it's just Taylor's internal monologue about how she's thinking about her impending betrayal that she's planning. So she's saying to herself more and more, I was seeing the day I turned that information over and said goodbye to the undersiders as the day I wanted to transform myself, start transforming Skitter into a hero in the public eye, doing what I could to repair my image and redefining Taylor into someone confident and outgoing and brave. If I could cut ties with the undersiders and take that plunge, I knew I could change myself. But strange as it sounded, I would feel worse about handing their information to the protectorate if this sort of negativity was what I was leaving behind when I did it. I knew it made no sense, but I wanted to be able to tell myself I'd had one successful set of friendships before I severed ties for the sake of doing the right thing. I could only hope that the sore feelings would fade. Yeah, that's realistic, Taylor, you fucking idiot. Um, <laughs> Matt, I, I love I, this. I mean, it's so it's so um, understandable. Like, like I get this mentality perfectly, and how deluded it is. Uh, yeah, yeah. It's just uh, it's so it's so great because this makes no sense. <laughs> I want to <laughs> prove that I had a good group of friends before I send them to prison. Like, like none of this makes any sense, and her. This idea that she can only become this brave, confident, outgoing person after she gets away from the villains. She can't just do it right now. Like, it's, I mean, eventually people are going to get old hearing us talk over and over, Ben, about Taylor's ability to compartmentalize and justify and avoid um, the real issues. And I think eventually we're not going to have to deal with this anymore. Cause I think in like two arcs, she's probably just going to admit that she's a bad guy. Um, but <laughs> you know, it's just like, it's just again and again, we see this and like, like I brought up jokingly at the beginning of, of the, the arc that she had an opportunity to do the thing she's been saying she wanted to do. Um, but it's almost as if she didn't even realize that that was an opportunity, you know? Yeah. And it, it's just, God, <laughs> yeah at this point i think she's just fantasizing about about this like to make herself feel better literally it's it's a it's a self-soothing technique it's not really planning yeah it's like when you it's like when you say okay this monday i'm gonna start exercising so i'm yeah, gonna do it yeah. it's gonna be monday i'm gonna get up i'm gonna do it and then you just yeah. keep telling yourself that yeah so then after all this uh taylor caps it off by confirming to rachel that mauling the dog fighting ring was a good thing. Yeah. Um, so are we ready to say that my prediction about them being best friends is correct yet? Or do we have to hold off a little, little longer for that? I mean, I think, I think within this arc, there's, there's, <laughs> there's definitely a, a trend going in that direction. So um, I think, I, I mean, we might as well call it, even though I think there's probably a lot more to, to say about that. Let's, let's hold off knowing what I know. Let's okay. Just, just let things progress. I shall trust you. Okay. So uh, 5.3 begins. We're, we've changed settings. Taylor is now shopping at the mall with her dad. It's, uh, it's the big Brockton Bay Mall, and the mall is on pretty tight security because uh, it's basically described as being like an airport because of the Bakuda bombing campaign. So they've got soldiers, PRT soldiers, uh, checking people as they enter and leave for bombs. And we got two hero capes, Battery and Shadowstalker, um, 
with the uh, with the PRT guys, and uh, they're kind of helping keep the peace. Um, it's also mentioned that Battery has a teammate named Assault, and uh, that's pretty, pretty <laughs> I, awesome. I, I get it because it's like Assault that's, and Battery. That's right. That's, Which is also they, a and, thing that's about to happen in this chapter. Exactly, and also, um, yeah, Assault and Battery are a thing. <laughs> um, so. Taylor, as Taylor's kind of staring at the heroes, she ruminates on her bias against Shadowstalker based on the fact that Guru and her have a have a uh, rivalry and on the fact that it's hard for her to be awed, awed by the presence of capes anymore because of the, her, the experiences she's had. Yeah, um, this is really interesting, and I think this is one of kind of our first big hints that um, Taylor and Skitter different personalities these divided worlds are kind of coming together um this is there's a real like air of superiority throughout this whole thing um she talks about how like she doesn't get why people get all excited about seeing these people and it like reminded me of like when a person becomes friends with a celebrity and then they're like sitting there being like i don't understand why people make it such a big deal out of celebrities like they're just yeah. people and it's like it just comes off as kind of dickish like i'm better like she looks around and sees all these people and says i'm better than all of you um right. and that's very kind of untailor um, but maybe more more skitterish. Yeah, which is probably a word I'm gonna have to say a lot. <laughs> yeah, I I think that's I think that's fair. I also do like the whole mental disconnect she has with Shadowstalker. Um, that like Shadowstalker was a bad guy who got caught and then basically said, "Okay, you're gonna serve good now, and that'll be your punishment." And she did it. And and that's like literally what Taylor is wanting to do. <laughs> she's <laughs> doing bad things and then wants to eventually rewrite herself as a good guy. And yet she's irrationally upset with this person. It's just yeah. it's just very interesting, right? Because she has a rivalry with Taylor's friend, who is in fact a supervillain. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, How dare you have a rivalry with a bad guy? Right. So they they randomly run into Taylor and her dad. Randomly run into Emma and her dad. Uh, which is kind of a great moment by itself because you just get this sinking feeling feeling in your stomach. Uh, so Emma predictably acts like nothing is amiss and smiles at Taylor, at which point Taylor cold talks her or, or maybe slaps her. It's not entirely clear. Um, Danny uh, Danny's able to, to play it off as a consequence of her concussion, and they leave after being harangued and actually zip-tied, or at least Taylor is zip-tied by Shadowstalker. I love how long and miserably uncomfortable the scene is the two dads just keep yammering on and it really is quite long where they're, they're just, and it's exactly the way like two dads would talk upon meeting just the most inane garbage. And, and you just feel the tension building and building in, in Taylor's head. And you're almost like, Oh, thank God. When Taylor finally hits her, uh, I think it's a great example of the power of this first person perspective that we're getting because you're being tricked into cheering for her assaulting someone who is not expecting it. Yeah, I think you're you're absolutely right. It's funny because if you look, um, it, when you see it just from her perspective, from the perspective we're presented with, it looks like a victory. It does, um, and it, it again is is Taylor acting more confident and doing something that Taylor in the first few arcs would never have done. Um, but f yeah, from an outside observer, this was a random act of violence. Um, we we think we know what Emma is thinking because Taylor. 100% knows what she's thinking. Um but you know we, we don't really know. I mean like yeah. and and again this is the, the the two parts of her are are coming together. One is bleeding over into the other. Um we've seen Taylor in costume react to a situation with violence to rash out and solve the problem with violence. And that's what we're seeing here. And you know while it is like it's good for her to stand up to her bullies probably punching them in the middle of a crowded mall is not the way to handle the situation. Yeah. Yeah. Unfortunately, neither is the way <laughs> that we're going to see in the next chapter. Right. Yeah. That's uh, this, this next chapter is um, pretty amazing. I think um, we're going to have to, do you want to, do you want to try to summarize it with me, Scott? Yeah. Um, I think, the, I think but, for this one, we're going to just like, do the chapter and then talk about it for a while. Cause this is, this is big. This is really yeah. big. Yeah. 
So they, they arrive and they're waiting. Uh, basically, Taylor and her dad arrive at the school and they're waiting for a, an administrative meeting or, or a, a, I don't know, a punitive meeting. I don't know what you'd call it exactly. Um, and you, you, it, it's kind of a big deal. You know, you've, it, you, it's really been built up actually quite a lot. You've got um, Emma and her dad and Madison and her parents. And then Sophia comes in with um, with like, what we're not sure who it is, but it might be like a caseworker or something. Mm -hmm. And several of the teachers are there. I forget even which of them. It's almost all of the main teachers. I think yeah, that we've it's the heard principal that, and then her homeroom teacher and then Gladly's there and then some other random ones, I think. Yeah. Some, some ones who we haven't heard the names of even. Um, so, so the principal kind of is hosting the meeting and it's, it's interesting because the meeting, I, I think the meeting was called by Taylor and her um, and her dad because Taylor had finally let her dad know that it was Emma that was behind the bullying. And so it's it's them that's calling the meeting, but it's a, it, as we'll find out later, I'm telling this out of order, but it's a very inopportune time to call the meeting because Taylor has just assaulted one of them. It would have been much better to <laughs> yeah. hold this meeting prior to this point. Um, so. They uh and and then actually yeah you know, so we find out that it's it's Emma's dad basically said I think we should take this through official channels because um because he's a coward and when Danny confronted him about the bullying he he wanted to to have things be on the record and, and he's a lawyer and I mean I like that touch that I think people in our society are actually terrified of lawyers um and 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 litigiousness in yes. general um because you really can't I mean, as they say in this chapter, you can kind of ruin someone's life if you have not even the law on your side, but a lawyer on your side. Um, so it, it gets to the point where they're asking her to detail uh, the the bullying ev events that were committed against her. And she starts basically reading this huge stack of papers and they're saying, um, um you know, you know, you don't need to read all of those. Let's let's not read the minor ones. Just stick to the major ones. And and she's trying to make. And Taylor is kind of making the point that that they're all they're all significant. None of them are minor. Like none of these none of these events feel minor. Yeah, I really love the bit where she says something to the effect of, "If you think it's a pain to sit there and have to listen to me read them to you, like imagine what it was like for me to live them." And I think that's yeah. like. Taylor, like as much as she kind of loses control a little bit later in this chapter, she is uh, she's very sharp here. Um, she acts kind of more adult than some of the adults in this situation. Um, the principal yeah. saying the line about like, you know, we have jobs we have to do is like super dismissive and rude and ridiculous. Um, yeah. And so uh, Taylor, she really handles herself very well for half of this conversation. Yeah. And I mean, on that note, it is clear to me that the adults are mainly interested in uh, uh, shirking blame of any kind whatsoever, and yeah. uh, which kind of speaks to the, the fear of litigiousness, I think, in a situation like this. Um, uh, just just one comment that Madison actually has the grace to look upset by all this, but uh, Sophia just looks angry and Emma looks bored and confident. Yeah. Um, so uh, Taylor also has all these emails, these abusive emails that she's received. And the probably, I don't know, maybe the most infuriating part is that Emma's dad kind of successfully argues that the emails shouldn't even be considered because they're from anonymous email accounts. Like, like Taylor would fabricate all of these. I mean, I mean, I guess right. you can't prove that they're from, I mean, yeah. And these, these specific kids, but you can't, but yeah, I just love it. Like the line about how, like, you know, when you've been a victim, you you tend to to over exaggerate certain things to make yourself more look more like the victim. And it's like, holy shit, how could a principal yeah. say that? Like, right. man. Yeah, right. I mean, and I mean, I think I, I don't know. I think that is actually within the realm of things that a principal could say if they get caught with their pants down in this particular way where where like a bad thing has been happening and has been allowed to continue happening, they're going to try to um, diminish the appearance of, of how bad it is. I, I think, I yeah, think that's true. Yeah. Or I mean, if they're a bad person, they are anyway. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, so I actually like, 
I, I so my wife is a, a fifth grade teacher. Um, so I kind of talked to her about this scene and like talk to her about, you know, in, in the real world. Cause I think this comes off as very, like my initial reaction was like, Oh God, like if this is happening in real schools, we have a serious problem. So I asked her about it. I was just curious. Cause she's always kind of, um, indicated to me that if like the word bully is used from a parent in an email or said out loud over a phone call, like they're, they're very bully averse in schools now. So you use that word and like it triggers a bunch of stuff that has to happen. But basically what, what my wife said was that, you know, as far as the emails and stuff go, um, you, you can't prove that they were them. And therefore like that was actually correct. That if Mm -hmm. you can't prove that the emails came from them, that you cannot punish anyone for them. Now, and I, I kind of jumped ahead a bit. Her request to be transferred out of the situation would be something that the school would very readily, absolutely do get the student out of this, the, the situation that they're in, but specifically punish the other kids unless they have documented proof of it. They, they really actually could not do that. Um, yeah. which is, I mean, it's disappointing, but I guess it makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. I think they have their excuses also why they can't transfer. Um, um, why they can't transfer Taylor. Yeah. I mean, I think that was the only part that probably like the principal just said, it's out of my hands. And I don't know if that's a real reflection of like a real school system, if they couldn't do that. Um, yeah. I think maybe if your if your school system was under attack by a bombing campaign by a super villain, it might change the dynamics. But yeah, I mean, <laughs> yeah. It, it's, it's, yeah, I mean, that, that's, that's, that's kind of good to hear. Cause I, I, especially because I'm reading worm, I think about bullying a lot because I have kids that are going to be starting normal school soon. And there's already, you know, impossibly complex social dynamics among four year olds. I shudder to think what it's going to be like when they're teenagers. Um, so, uh, so I'm, I have a, I have a personal stake in the school system's ability to mitigate bullying. So at this point, um, at this point, I think things go off the rails because someone um, kind of implies that Taylor might be Taylor might be the one freaking out because of her mom's death. Yeah, it was and, it was Emma's father, which was just okay, yeah. smarmy and fucking terrible. Yeah, and at this point, Taylor throws the papers off the off the desk and kind of kind of stops trying to be civil i think because i think she also in addition to being angry about that i think she detects that nothing is going to go her way at this point because she's just seen that the principal is kind of stonewalling yeah and i mean it's one thing you know to get pushed back against the people you're accusing right but like the way this whole thing was set up and i love the little touch about how no one like they're they all sat around a table and like no one sat on their side except for one of her teachers. Like everyone else sat on the other side. Um, like God, I can imagine that like that set up and like, it just shows you like she was feeling from the beginning that this whole thing was just, you know, like just, just preposturing, like nothing was going to actually come of it. And as she sees it, it, that's the way it's actually going. Yeah. She starts losing control. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, it is at at, a, at roughly this point that she requests to be transferred, and um, you know, I, I think, I think that yeah. So so the the, the administrators basically say, no, no, we would rather we would rather do this a different way. We would rather give them suspension. That's what we would prefer. And Taylor's like, no, that's a terrible idea. That's just a vacation. Um, and ultimately, even though Taylor explains in detail why suspension is like there, there's no justice in that punishment, it's it's just something where they can like mark down in their files that they successfully dealt with the bullying event by giving a suspension. Um, that's what they end up doing. They don't do any of the things she suggests that would actually be more just and or actually solve her problem. So it's kind of almost a it's close to being a worst case scenario, actually. And uh, at, at, Toward the end of this, she's she's repeatedly having to push the bugs away because they're reacting to her stress and, and agitation and keep trying to, to come in. Um, yeah, I did want to see where's that. I, I did want to highlight the moment where she says um, where she says 
scanning, sorry. Maybe I'll bring a weapon to school, I said, glaring at them. If I threatened to stab one of those girls, would you at least expel me, please? I could see Emma's eyes widen at that. Good. Maybe she'd hesitate before hassling me again. Um, in my experience, just saying this would have gotten Taylor suspended uh, uh, because yeah. Yeah. I think schools are pretty hypersensitive about any, like, the most innocent. It's, it's, like, it's like airport security, seriously, from yeah, my they, reflection I mean, in high school. They honestly probably would have just called the police at that moment um, yeah. because, yeah, they, they do not screw around with this kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, so beyond this point, yeah, they, they just kind of, uh, the Taylor and her dad try to push it a bit farther. And Alan at this point brings up the fact that Taylor hit Emma the previous night. And that means now he's basically invoking his, I'm a lawyer and I will make this very costly for you card. And Danny knows that he's not going to be able to really really deal with this and even if he even if he goes to the uh even if he goes to the media it's it's probably there's not there's not going to be any justice it's going to be it's going to be too painful for them um so yeah that's that's the meeting uh, pretty much immediately after the meeting taylor storms out and calls her supervillain friends so that she can go get her frustration out with some supervillain ultra violence <laughs> Oh man. So this so the one big thing I want to say about this whole chapter is I think this is the best written um chapter we've seen of this story so far. Um I really like from the from the get-go like they establish this level of tension and like Wild Bo just just keeps this level of tension throughout the whole thing and ramps it up when when he needs to and like the fact that she's like constantly having to push away her bugs and like we're fully aware of like how bad it could be if she loses control of that um while all this stuff is going on like it's just it's just such a perfect like construction of how to dole out a scene um and yeah. it's just so engaging and so wonderful and like like you're frustrated you're stressed like you're heartbroken you feel you're feeling all of these things at the same time um and it's just it's just fabulously done like i loved this chapter i really did yeah at the beginning of this uh podcast i said something like yeah and there's a great super villain uh, superhero battle in this in this in this arc and i immediately kind of laughed at myself internally because i was like that's the cliche thing you would say about a a superhero story but actually this arc is the arc that has the school administrator meeting and that's <laughs> the most dramatic like that's the most right. like dramatic thing that actually happens in this arc it's not the most you know it's not the, the scene that would cost the most in a in a in a movie um but it's the like like you just said you're feeling all these gut-wrenching emotions and that really speaks to how how invested we are in this character at this point. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, the biggest thing that all this is that, um, Taylor's impression of the power of authority being useless and untrustworthy is like totally vindicated here. Like everything she thought that would go wrong, um, went wrong. They can't protect her. They can't, they can't administer actual justice. They can't even just remove her from the situation. They are powerless to help her. Um, the only thing that I think is different when in this case and all the others is that Danny really backs her up in these moments. Like he's there with her. Um, like he's he's he does try to calm her down in a few moments, but like he a hundred percent believes everything she says. He's a hundred percent there for her. Um, and, and maybe maybe he and her relationship is salvageable. Um, yeah. And this, it kind of gives you that hint. And I love that moment of when she's wandering off where he says something to the effect of, I can't remember the exact line, but it's like, don't do anything rash or, or like stupid, yeah. like, which I mean, I, I don't want to make a speculation on this, but it seems like maybe he knows a little bit more about what's going on than he, he says he does. Um, but it's very, it's very interesting. Um, and mm -hmm. I, I liked these, these like amidst all this terribleness and like Taylor's world as Taylor is literally crumbling in front of her. Like her father is for once like there with her. And I, I liked that a lot. Yeah. Yeah. I, I do like that. She at least has that, but also that he is, 
he is ineffectual and powerless despite right. his best efforts. Right, right. So he's not really a figure of power. He's just a just someone who's who who is, if anything, reinforcing her impression that power can't do anything for her, and she has to take power into her own hands. Yeah, and and again, you know, we've seen again and again whenever life as Taylor gets too hard to deal with, she runs away to mm -hmm. her other life. Um, mm -hmm. And and like she said, the word escape. I mean, she literally defined one of the themes for us, and here yeah. it is again. Here's her escape. Um, and, and the thing I really want to emphasize about this is that nothing she does for the rest of this chapter serves to move her closer to her established goal of discovering who the boss of this organization is. Um, this isn't a, a job given by the boss. Like, nothing that's done here helps that mission at all. This is purely something that Taylor is doing, that Taylor is participating in because she wants to. She even had an out. Like, they said, oh, your concussion's still not not fully healed. So we don't want to take you into battle. So she had an excuse for why she couldn't participate in this thing, but no, she's doing this because she wants to. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's a big deal. Yep. Yep. So at this point, she, she has stormed off to join the assault against the ABB. And it's basically got these multiple task forces assembled out of, the supervillain gangs that we met at the beginning of this arc. Uh, they split up the the villains between the different groups as a form of uh, security, basically. So Alec and Lisa go with Faultline, Trickster, and Genesis. Um, at this point, I guess we might, we might want to mention some of these some of these powers. Although I don't know if Trickster's or Genesis's powers. Yeah, well, we'll skip that. We'll come back to the, we'll come back to their powers because yeah, one of them was yet. the giant monkey. That's all I know. <laughs> yeah, the so four armed Genesis, monkey. Right. In fact, I don't even think Genesis's name was given here. No. But I'm not gonna feel too bad about saying that. Yeah. Um. Uh. So basically, I think I think they refer to it as a shapeshifter, and basically it's like a, it's it, it's, you know, last time we were or previously we were talking about the the monstrous pair of humans and. This one doesn't appear to be a monster spirit human because it can change shape, so we're not actually sure what its underlying nature is. Uh, so also, Taylor's power seems weirdly stronger today. Her range is almost doubled. Why, why would that possibly be, Scott? Hmm, I don't know. Um, maybe we'll talk about it in Scott's Speculations. All right, sounds good. Uh, at this point, it's noted that Taylor, uh, sorry, that Rachel can read Taylor's body language remarkably well and can tell that she's angry even when she's wearing her costume. Uh, but still verbal communication, face plants when they try to have a conversation about it. And this is yet yet more building towards something that we're going to get to. Yep, just a little breadcrumbs we're throwing here. Cleverly yep. placed breadcrumbs that, like, on the surface, like, it doesn't seem like it could build anything. But when it is revealed, all of a sudden you, like, go back to those moments and are like, oh, oh, mm -hmm. yeah, that all, yep. that's all adding up. Yeah, it all makes sense. So they meet at the lighthouse. They rendezvous with Rachel, uh, or rather, Rachel goes with her to meet Kaiser, Fenya, Minya, Sundancer, Neuter, Labyrinth, and several of Coil's unpowered commandos. I think it's Fenya and Minya, not Fenja and Minja. Even though I read it as Fenja and Minja in my head the uh, entire time. I, that's what I read. <laughs> um, so, so Kaiser's being all Kaiser and making subtle, impeccably aggressive. Uh, passive aggressive power plays, and uh, in response, Rachel just causes her dogs to transform rapidly and explode blood and viscera all over everyone, and then gallops off, which I thought was a pretty funny moment. Yeah, it, it's really cool that we kind of get like as they're wander as they're heading to this lighthouse, they're like, um, we're seeing how bad this part of the city is. There's like blown up bridges, piles of rubble. Like they're 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 not in a city anymore. This has become a war zone and that again like enforces the fact that you know we've moved past this silly game of of cops and robbers we're now just in like full on gang warfare and taylor has has implanted herself right right in the middle of all this yeah and there's one thing i i forget the exact number but i think we heard it in, in the documentary that danny was watching about scion that you know su superheroes have been around for something like between 20 and 30 years or, or something in that range, maybe 30 years at this point in time. Mm -hmm. And 
when you think about it in those terms, it's it's like, yeah, there is it's, it's this huge this huge impactor to the societal framework, and there's absolutely no reason to believe that one day there were no superpowers, the next day there were people with superpowers, and then the world just reached new equilibrium. What we're watching is the the dominoes continuing to fall in, as a result of the emergence of superpowers. So maybe there, you know, 30 years ago, this world was probably just like ours, and we're on a certain trajectory away from that world. And there's there's no there's no inexplicable force causing a status quo like Gotham City being exactly the same forever, regardless of the fact that mm-hmm. it's constantly being like gassed by the Joker or whatever. Um, th- there's there's no reason to believe that the status quo is is some uh, attractive uh, state. Yeah, there's no end of the week where all the problems are solved and then we go back to the status quo at the beginning of the next week. There's none of that. It's just perpetual issues and problems and and terribleness, it seems. Yeah. So starting uh, chapter 5.6, Skitter is uh, getting chatty with Sundancer. Basically, she decides she needs to socialize and start building some some relationships with these other villains. And uh, Sundancer, when when asked, describes her life as a supervillain as intense, violent, lonely, which I thought was a neat little slight slap in the face to Taylor at this point in time. Yeah, I, I love I love those words, and I love how they're they're given to her. Um, it, you know, like Taylor's life as Skitter has been pretty great so far for her. I mean, she did like almost die that that one time, but she survived that. Um, but she's she's made friends, she's gotten increased confidence, um, and then we see in this other person this uh, a person that's living a very similar type of life and and telling Taylor that it's bad um she's not she doesn't seem very happy in it she seems reluctant to be in this life um and we see you know one of the paths that taylor's choices could lead to um a a path filled with intense violent and lonely things and it's sad Sad. yeah and 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 it apparently you know how things go as a villain seems like it can depend a lot on what what group of people you happen to be with? She right. so sun dancers with the travelers. I imagine the experience of being uh, in in the Empire eighty eight would be different in a different direction. Yeah. Um, so so Taylor's just been kind of lucky at this point. So they they're approaching um, their destination, and Kaiser pretty much immediately splits up the group at the first sign of of enemy troops, and he takes Fenya and Minya with him to circle around the back of the building. So I just wanted to say here before we go on that Taylor's got bugs in her hair and all uh, over her armor and it's really gross. <laughs> yeah. I can't like she says, oh, I just put them in place. Like no one would notice them crawling around in my hair. It's like, Ugh. Yeah. like I shuddered when I read that. It's like, yeah. have you ever had a bug in your hair? It's so gross. As we'll see in in a short while, actually, she's increasingly just kind of using them as her sixth sensory sense. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, I think she doesn't even perceive them that way at all anymore. Like it's, 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 and we've seen this a couple of times where she's like confused and thinks it's, it's silly when someone has a problem with there being bugs everywhere. Um, yeah. Yeah. So Taylor sends a human shaped swarm into the building looking basically, uh, scouting, but also trying to set off booby traps because she expects there to be some, and she succeeds in doing that. She sets off one of Bakuda's bombs. Um, Rachel and Neuter ingress, and Kaiser, Fenya, and Menya attack from the opposite side. Um, Taylor's noticing that all the bugs that are touching Neuter are stunned, and uh, she surmises that he has some kind of touch. Or maybe, maybe she already knows this. He has some kind of touch-based um, neurotoxic um, power in addition to being basically like a human-sized. Um, amphibian you know a gecko or something in, in terms of how he how he's able to move around like a newt like a newt yes well <laughs> i was thinking I, I don't actually know how newts behave but i know how geckos behave so probably more like a newt though you're right um <laughs> so then uh he's he's suddenly ganked by someone who we realize is oni lee so we didn't we didn't know oni lee was there and then rachel on the phone says that long is also there so this has gone from uh 
from a reasonable situation to a pretty bad one because they got both of the very strong capes of the of the uh, ABB there. Can you like I, I don't know like <laughs> this just image of her like realizing that there are super villains there and frantically calling Rachel on the cell phone while she's like riding a giant monster dog inside of a building attacking people. <laughs> it's just like pick up your cell phone. It's just like the image of it made me laugh. I don't know why. Uh-huh. I think they okay. need to get radios. <laughs> Is what I'm yeah, saying. I, yes, that's that's a good point. That, that's kind of funny, yeah. But yeah, I mean, this is, like, I think I'm noticing these superhero fights have a certain escalation trend to them. Um, and, and we already talked about how escalation was one of the themes of the story, so that makes sense. But uh, just when our characters think they have a handle on things, uh, new people show up and, and things get more complicated. Yeah, there's there's a lot more people involved in this fight, I think, than the previous one where we just had the Undersiders and, and Bakuda. Um, and also, there's like explicit intent to kill here. I mean, in the previous case, we had Long trying to kill Taylor and we had Bakuda trying to kill everyone. But now we have Kaiser's trying to kill Long and Long's trying to kill everyone. So um, it's there's escalation of the level of violence, there's escalation of the intent to kill. The escalation of the collateral damage, I would say, is getting pretty yeah, uh, pretty tense. Yeah, absolutely. So 5.7 starts, and once again, Taylor is immediately throwing herself into stark danger for the sake of a teammate she doesn't even like. Um, she's she's heading in. She she's basically running into this building with Lung and and Oni Lee in there uh, to try to save Rachel. Yeah, and, and more important than that, like she totally takes charge, right? Like mm-hmm. originally, Kaiser put himself in charge. As soon as he split up the group and left, Neuter just kind of stepped in and said, and was making all the plans and doling out the assignments and stuff. But as soon as he's down for the count, like Taylor takes over and it's just her leading the troops for the rest of the battle. Um, yeah. But yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, like the thing, Taylor throwing herself into danger for someone she doesn't even really like, like Taylor, like we talk about her a lot and the bad choices she's making. And we touched on this last week a little bit at her core. Like she really is a good person. Um, and like, it's going to become increasingly like cloudy and confusing as we go deeper into this world without black and white, you know, where good guys aren't necessarily good guys. Bad guys aren't necessarily bad guys. You know, Taylor at her core is good, right? Um, Mm -hmm. she makes bad choices, um, but we've seen what evil looks like in this world. We've seen uh, Bakuda last week, um, and that's not who she is. Um, yeah. She's she's hanging out on the slippery slope, like she's like camping on the slippery slope. Um, but she is a good person, and and the small moments like this serve to remind us of that. That um, she is going to save a person, and yeah, it's a villain, but to her, it's a human being, and she doesn't even really think about it. Um, and and that I think is really important. Yeah, I think at this point in the story, it, if anything, um, we're we're investigating how far you can push a person who isn't actually a psychopath into doing some things that appear to be pretty evil. I mean, uh, we're, we're gonna we're gonna see how Sundancer responds to her actions at some point. Yeah, soon. yeah. Um, uh, so so we're see, we're gonna see some pretty cool. I mean, it's it's too complex to to summarize, but basically, Oni Lee is teleporting around and basically taking apart the whole good guy team, including the mercenaries who are with them. Um, he's already taken down neuter. And I, I just, I kind of love Oni Lee's power because it's, it's much more fun than just teleportation. It's teleportation with a really cool twist, which is one of the things that I like. There's always a cool twist on the powers in this story. So like he, he teleports in that he, you know, he looks over there and then he appears over there. But the the version of him that was standing here remains here for a few seconds and can still violence people. So it's almost like he's temporarily duplicating himself over and over and over. Um, yeah, but then and, like the second one can teleport away like as soon as it appears. So it can jump to a new place, throw a knife and then teleport away again. So you can't ever hit him because you're just killing the copy over and over again. It's yeah. awesome. <laughs> right. And and he's almost invincible in the sense that he's at, at a certain point, he's, he's teleporting so frequently that he he's only actually in one spot for a couple seconds. So he's really just right. leaving like a daisy chain of, of copies who are who are only 
who are basically taking advantage of their couple seconds of life to, to attempt something. And then he's just, it's, it's a pretty, it's, it, yeah, I mean, it's, it's really unique. And he, and Waldo kind of keeps track of some of the ramifications of this, which is that like when he copies himself, he can obviously copy the grenades that he's carrying. So he can do things like, I think this is mentioned when they describe him in the first place that he can like teleport into a place and then out immediately. And the guy and the version of him that went in has grenades and then you, and then the grenades detonate and kill everyone inside yeah. the place. And so it's, he's very deadly and, uh, um, also kind of like ruthless in, in terms of just going for the kill constantly. Matt, this stuff is so cool. <laughs> it's so yeah. cool. Yeah. I don't, um, I don't. So could you explain to me, uh, labyrinth's power? Cause I, I don't, I'm having trouble. I don't, I don't get it. Um, I'm not so, so my poor memory is a, is a service to us here because I never quite remember exactly certain things that I should know because I read this story, but I believe that she can effectively like bend and manipulate a, a large area to, to be what she imagines it to be, or at least to act on human beings the way she imagines that it would act on human beings. So you'll be standing in a room and you'll see it morph and, and, you know, marble pillars come up the walls and you, you walk over to the marble pillars and you touch them and you feel them and they're real. And you walk up a staircase that wasn't there before and you can actually walk up it. But in another sense, they're not actually like real, real because he can sort of turn off the effect of the power on you. And then you can just see the room as it actually is and walk around. So I don't know on like a, a, the level of like, what's physically happening. I don't know if she's, yeah. I don't know whether she's actually changing the room or whether she's just constructing like a holodeck Star Trek reference. Yeah. I mean, she's speci like, she specifically like Taylor asked if they're illusions and she shakes her head. So it's like, it's there, but it's not. And that's, I was just very confused. Yeah. And maybe that's uh, the labyrinth is just confusing. So maybe that's intentional. Yeah. yeah. I, I feel like it's explained clearly at some point um but it's one of those things where uh the kind of the fun of the fun of it is that it is kind of complicated it's not just if it was just illusions then it would be like well then how can people walk on them um so yeah i don't know i i, I think it's pretty cool she's 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 really strong but she has this uh, limitation of basically being really out of it and not being verbal actually right right so as they're fighting only Lee Taylor realizes that she's able to track where he's going because he's duplicating the bugs that are touching him whenever he teleports. And she's kind of able to help coordinate people. And only Lee, I think, I think his actual body finally gets clipped by a sniper who he previously pulled off the roof. Uh, I, I think that's why he flees. I don't know. I, I believe that's why he flees. And, uh, as an aside, Coil's mercenaries are, are badasses. It would be a hell of a thing to try to be a military man in a world with these demigods running around. Yeah, I, man, it took me like four arcs to stop underestimating superheroes with, and their powers. And now suddenly I have to stop underestimating just soldiers. Because like, uh -huh. I mean, yeah, like the, the, the super powered villains were losing this fight and the dudes with guns got them back into it. So yeah, these guys are pretty great. And, and like I think one thing is they don't they don't show you what Coil's power is. He's very mysterious. So I wouldn't be altogether surprised if part of his power was to affect the people around him and make them like super good at what they do. Um I don't know. That's just that's just speculation, but That's interesting. That's that's the kind of speculation we come here for though, Scott. <laughs> so we move on into 5.8, they've chased off Oni Lee. Um, Rachel, Sundancer, and Skitter head into the warehouse to rescue Neuter, who is basically bleeding out. Um, Rachel argues that they should be fighting along, not rescuing Neuter, who she doesn't care about. But Taylor kind of very aggressively makes the case that they need to protect him for the sake of their friends who are with fault line, and presumably she would take it poorly if they left Neuter to die. So inside, we see that the building is basically like a drug packaging and distribution operation, which explains why Taylor had previously noticed that everybody inside was in their underwear. They find the badly injured neuter, 
And Taylor is able to very calmly and creatively figure out how to patch up his wounds and transport him without being able to touch his skin. So she's like very confidently giving orders and thinking of creative solutions to these problems. Um, I think this is a great moment showing her development in, in a way that isn't, it's not a violence, like it's not calm under violence, but it is calm under tension. Yeah. She's really good at this dude. She doesn't lose her head. She doesn't panic. She just instructs the troops. Um, and she, you know, just, you know, steals some money while she's at yep. it. Yeah, uh, just, just passively. He just casually tells her bugs, yeah. oh, my bugs aren't doing anything now. How about you rob the place? Yeah. We're, we're finally seeing, or I don't know, we're, we're seeing a lot more of the side of her that Tattletail suggested that she, she had when they had their girl talk while they were shopping. Where, where she was saying, yeah, you, you know, you, you think, you plan, you execute, you're calm. It's like this, this is what she's, that's her right here. I mean, this is a, this is a terrible situation. Like Sundancer, for example, is, I think, taking it much more the way a normal person would. She's very frightened and, and, and a little bit, a little bit unsure. Uh, whereas Taylor at this point is just, like you said, stepping up. Yeah, you're absolutely right. That's, that's her here. Like none of the decisions she's making here are rash. They're all uh, thought through. Um, even the idea of taking the money, she thinks about it and it's like makes a logical decision. Well, my bugs are not being used, so I might as well make them do something and and rob the ABB of their money um, so they yep. can't use it to hurt people. So, I mean, it, it all. Yeah, she is a leader here. Um, yeah. And, uh, you know, we've seen hints of that before, like when everything at the bank was going down, she um, like directed people around a little bit. But this is this is like pure like take control and lead the entire array of troops, especially people she just met, right? Like she's not even comfortable with these people. She doesn't even know them, but she's, she just, she just jumps into it and it's, it's, it's impressive. Yeah. I think this also speaks to detail about her power, which we've, we've seen over and over. Um, but I don't think it's ever been like, like focused on is that she seems to be able to have no trouble giving like, hundreds of bugs complex orders to grab sacks of or you know to, to gather up and and transport money while also thinking through this problem of how to how to help neuter so the the fine scale control of large numbers of of bugs is not actually uh hard for her at all like it's 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 second nature i mean it's very easy it's it's something that she can do almost without thinking. And I think that's just uh, interesting because, you know, it could it could have gone a different way. It could have been that it took all of her focus to control the bugs and she had to manually kind of control them. But it, mm -hmm. it's more like she's able to to just send them orders and they just do kind of what she intends. Yeah, she's she's the queen bee of mm -hmm. the bugs and, and of, of people now, too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that's a great statement. Um, so at this point. Uh, Lung basically enters by strolling in through a hole in the wall that one of the giant people in this situation has made. I'm not sure which, but there's several giant people involved now. Uh, Lung is enormous, and he has the beginnings of wings at his shoulders and a cat-like face with a mouth that I visualize as being like the Predator's. Yeah, I, I, I honestly, like, literally had that exact same picture in my head. <laughs> like, exactly. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know if that's what Wild Bo was going for, but that's what popped into my head. Yeah, I think I think it's probably close enough to uh, to get the right impression. Kaiser follows him in and rapidly shows why Kaiser commands respect by keeping this giant dragon monster at bay by creating these giant metal spikes wherever Lung moves to keep to uh, basically. It's it's interesting because Kaiser actually, if anything, has Lung on the defensive at this point, and then Finya and Minya are both 20 feet tall uh, and just as strong as they should be for that size. So, Scott, we have two parahuman twin sisters, and they have the same power. What's going on here? Yeah, so, I mean, what we know so far about parahumans and the powers they get is there is a, a, a trigger event, and normally it seems like the uh, the power that is gained has something either metaphorically or actually to do with um, with the circumstances of that that trigger event, so this seems to contradict that. 
Um, this seems, it kind of seems like something that maybe the power is genetic or I, I'm not sure, but it does seem to kind of contradict what we know so far. Um, mm-hmm. and, and I don't know what exact, where exactly that leads, but it is interesting. Um, okay. I, I honestly right. had not thought of this before you pointed that out. So I'm glad you did. I, I certainly didn't think about it. Um, when I first read the story, but, but it's like, I, I don't even know if it's mentioned that they're twins at this point. So I might've screwed that up for you, but they are two pair of humans with the same power. So that's that in it, that in and of I'm pre- itself. Is I'm pretty remarkable. sure. Yeah. They said they were twins. Yeah. Okay. All right. So we move into 5.9. Taylor moves to help, and Kaiser tries to decline her assistance, basically says we've got it under control. And she, correctly, I think, argues that if you're going to put Lung down, you'd better do it quickly and decisively before he turns into a goddamn dragon. Uh, so basically, before this point, they should have already beaten him because it, he's he's really strong now. Yeah, it really isn't until this moment that you you understand like how like either lucky or completely uh, overmatched Taylor was the first time she fought Lung. Cause this guy, I mean, he gets, he gets a freaking um, metal beam through his heart and just keeps on fighting. Uh, yeah. It's crazy. Yeah. yeah. I guess you could argue that if you, if you get him with something like a poison at, at an early stage in his transformation, that's the closest thing to a weakness he has, even though I wouldn't really call that a weakness. Um, yeah. Which is what she does to him, basically, or what she did to him. Yeah, like, yeah, as, as you say, Kaiser drops a giant blade the size of a truck on him, and all he does is melt it off of himself with pyrokinesis and basically ends up stronger um, for, for having done it. So at this point, at this point, it's pretty clear that Kaiser is trying to kill him in earnest. I mean, if it wasn't already. Um, well, he's like stabbing every other gang member. Like, because there's a yeah. bunch of ABB gang members all over the place, and he's just like, he's not even, I, I couldn't, I don't think it was clear that he was killing them. I don't think he was killing them. He was just like pinning them to the floor by stabbing like their appendages with metal and stuff. Yeah, um, basically just torturing right. them because they're not white because he's a Nazi. Yeah. Yeah. He's manages to insert a racist monologue into his, into his assault. Yeah. It's re- really uh, impressive. <laughs> yeah. So, so at this point, like it's lung is getting so strong that, um, that, that the, uh, Empire 88 folks are having difficulty keeping him in pocket. Um, so S- Sundancer is finally convinced to step in because, because it's obviously going off the rails a bit. And she keeps, she keeps protesting that she doesn't want to step in because her power is too deadly, uh, which Taylor at first thinks is kind of silly, uh, but it, it, I think it is true. I, I like her power simply for the contrast it provides, especially to Taylor's. Her miniature son seems like it could put down on almost anybody seems like she could have killed Lung at this point in time if she hadn't pulled it back on purpose when Kaiser pushes Lung toward it. Um, it's like basically a nuclear fireball, uh, but yeah. it's basically got no, no versatility, like unless you want to kill somebody. Uh, in contrast, Taylor has to be really clever to use her power, but ultimately she can do a really wide variety of stuff. She can, she can do reconnaissance. She can fight. She can, uh, we haven't even seen, frankly, the, the versatility she can achieve with it. Yeah, and and it 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 kind of fits it like again, Wildbow is so good at setting things up and having them pay off. Like this realization with her would not mean as much if we didn't have this little tiny scene before the battle happened where we kind of define her as a character and we she says, you know, uh, violent and lonely um and I don't remember the the third word, but um like you can see with a power like that that literally your only purpose is uh, is to be a wrecking ball to kill things um how how alienating that must feel yeah like it would sort of be a it would sort of suck to have that power if you're just a normal person you're like right. i can't i can't fly around and save people i can't i can't take a hit that i can like decimate a building full of people i guess if i wanted to do that that i never would so and like can you imagine when she's just first like figuring out the power like how would you practice that <laughs> like it's just right. like jesus yeah right so uh despite some dancers intervention they they didn't manage to kill long so he's even stronger now and his body keeps rearranging and now he's 
he's kind of just a dragon, and he quickly defeats Kaiser, Finya, and Minya at this point because he's now definitely stronger than them, and his pyrokinesis is so strong that he just dissipates Sundancer's orb when she tries to create it again. Uh, and he's probably going to kill everybody except Taylor manages to successfully taunt him into grabbing her, and our low self-esteem teenage protagonist snarls into the face of the dragon. Don't fucking underestimate me. Which is pretty cool, I think. Yeah, I was so confused at this moment. Um, this is set up perfectly. Like, I love that, like, you know, we talk about we my one gripe with mysteries without purpose, but holding back this information worked because it created this moment where, like, mm-hmm. she she does this thing and we're in her head, so we probably should have seen her do this thing, but we don't learn about it until afterwards um, is a really nice moment. I like yeah. it. Do, do we have any hint that she has a plan in the works? I, I, I'm, I'm not, I don't recall exactly. No, no. no. in fact, it seems like she, she didn't, she specifically was like when she like said, it's me, the one you want. She comments the fact is like, Oh, what, what have I done now? <laughs> um, so I don't know. I, like part of me wonders if, if this was like, a conscious decision or just something she did like split second, you know, without really thinking about it. Like we see again and again that she's, you know, dictating her bugs movements without thinking about them. Um, she mm-hmm. comments on how she's surprised that like the complex movements of directing the bugs to pick up each individual dollar and put them in bags and fly them away um, was really easy for her. So um, I wonder how much of this was she was personally aware of in the moment. Now, of course, afterwards, she fully realizes it. But I wonder in that specific moment if she was aware that she was doing this. Mm-hmm. My interpretation is that she was, but I, that's, that's an interesting angle for looking at this scene. Yeah, so what she did is she had a, a cockroach pick up a caterpillar, dab it in some neuter goo that was left over from his injury, and then had the cockroach climb down up lung and then put the caterpillar in lung's eyeball, um, which immediately causes him to pass out because of, uh, because of neuter's psychotropic secretions. So smart. Yeah. Right. And and, I mean, it was, I think it was a huge gambit because she had no, I mean, I guess not only a gambit, but it requires a lot of, of thinking because you're like, okay, well, the only part of him that's going to, maybe not be completely armored is his eyeball now. And hopefully his nervous system is still close enough to human that this is going to work on it. And <laughs> there's like a huge chance that could have just not worked. So. Yeah. I um, mean, and, and she was seconds from death. Like he had her yeah. in her arm, in his arms. Like he was stepping on Rachel at the time. Like they were screwed if this gambit didn't pay off. Right. I mean, he, he basically was was just messing with them and could have like just crushed them effortlessly at this point. Yeah. 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 And then, of course, once he's down, um, she calls Tattletail, verifies that Lung will eventually recover from any injury and then carves out his eyeballs with a knife. <laughs> you said that about as casually as she does it because yeah. she fucking rips his eyeballs out one by one. Yeah, knowing that, knowing that he's not going to recover them for like months, basically, is that is that accurate? Yeah, yeah. And um, and and the thing with me is like how she feels about it, and she addresses how she feels about it. That mm-hmm. she feels nothing. Right. Um. Uh, and and it's not it's not coldness like she specifically says like Gru described. It's just like this is something I had to do, and therefore it is the right thing to do. And I will do it. Yep. It's like, yep, I, I need to put a Band-Aid on that. I, I will. Yeah. yeah. It's nothing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's okay, Scott, because she knew he wasn't going to lose his eyes permanently. So. Yeah, it's fine. Don't, it's don't, fine. Don't as long as it. the consequences aren't permanent, your actions yeah. are, are fine. Yeah. 5.10 begins. Taylor leaves. She calls 911 to alert the good guys to come pick up Lung. And then she goes back uh, to touch base with Sundancer and Neuter. Uh, and Sundancer gives her a hard time about carving out Lung's eyes, um, which I think 
Sundancer is almost serving as kind of a voice of normality throughout this entire scene. Yeah, and yeah. Part of the purpose that serves is to give us a contrast to how far along the path Taylor has gone. Um, she has the, the decency to be shocked by all this still. <laughs> yeah. Oh, man. Um, and again, you know, we've talked about this, like, we talked about the beginning of the, the, the hour that to Taylor, the ends absolutely do justify the means. Um, but the problem, especially with that, is that Taylor is the only one that is able to define what the ends are that are justified by them. So, like, you know, she's going at it alone here. She's infiltrating these people. She's making all these decisions. And then she is going back and rationalizing the decisions that she's made by saying that in the end, good things happen. But, yeah. but only by her definition of what good things are. And right. that is even not the, good. You know, yeah, even the superheroes she's interacted with don't approve of this. It's it's like it, it's entirely her own definition of 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 uh, morality. Right. Which she I just, mean, everyone she freaked out a supervillain. I mean, that's what that's yeah. what happened. Is a, an actual real supervillain is like disturbed and freaked out by her behavior. Yeah, I mean, this is yet another time when. It would be it would be fun to see outside of her head and see how she appears, and we, we do get those glimpses sometimes. But like you've got this, you've got this kind of thin, described sometimes as sort of skeletal-looking teenage girl with black and gray armor and and an insectoid mask, like covered in swarms of insects, and probably behaving creepily and knowing things she shouldn't know because she's perceiving things through her bugs. Right. And doing ultra violent things without feeling any emotion about it. Like she probably comes off as absolutely terrifying. Um Yeah, and it's so it's so it, it telling how that first person perspective kind of hides all this from you. We know yeah. Taylor because we see inside Taylor's head and we know her thought processes and we know her as this girl who's going through all these things. But yeah, from an external perspective, this has got to be some scary shit. <laughs> I yeah. mean, yeah, it's crazy. It's crazy. Yeah. So they're talking to, talking to Neuter and Taylor takes it upon herself to give uh, I think the larger share of the money, if not all of it, to to Neuter and and Labyrinth. Um, Labyrinth doesn't accept the money because she's she's kind of out of it and can't really react. And at this point, Neuter kind of uses himself and Labyrinth as as object examples to show like sometimes sometimes getting a power messes up your body and it turns you into a human newt and sometimes it messes up your mind and it gives you the ability to transform reality, but puts you in a different reality or, or something or whatever's going on with her. Um, yeah. Yeah. And here's, here's the end of that setup, you know, from the beginning and it, it's going to be carried one step further here in a few chapters, but yeah, I mean, that's, that's a very interesting um, way of looking at things that I've never really thought of before is how, how having these powers messes you up mentally is not something mm -hmm. that's been, um, you know, we've looked again, again, we've looked at the, the mental effects of the choices that people have made, but we've never really looked at, um, how the existence of them by themselves divorced of the choices, what those can do to a person's brain. Um, and yeah, that's I mean, really interesting. I mean, just, I mean, you could almost take anyone, but, but just think about tattletale and, and how, right. You know, regardless of, of anything else you think about her or, you know, just think about having that power. Like, do you necessarily want to always know too much about everything that you encounter? Like the, the, the almost like we don't we don't know how we don't know how she perceives her power to work. But but the fact is that she. She kind of just has access to information she shouldn't have all the time. And, and I bet that that influences your, your thinking, your behavior in, in certain ways. Yeah. I mean, we, we last week spent a long time accusing her of being a person you can never take at face value and you can never trust. And it's maybe mm -hmm. just because, yeah, I mean, imagine your entire life being exposed to everyone's deepest, darkest secrets and what that would do to you mentally as a human being. Um, right. And this is, this is like our first glimpse into this whole different thing that I had never really considered um, 
any more than just at a, at face value. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we're going to see a, a precise consequence of that uh, pr pretty quickly, actually. Um, but, before, you know, at, on our way there, you know, so we have this, this interaction between, um, between, uh, between Rachel and Taylor as they, as they write off and then leave the other villains behind. It's this, it's this extended interaction that I really love um, as Taylor now has this seed in her mind about what might be going on with Rachel and she's starting to put the pieces together and she's kind of probing at Rachel and uh, basically guesses that Rachel's brain has been messed up by her power in a similar way to how Labyrinth's power messes up her, her mind. And, uh, and then Lisa comes back and she, and t uh, Taylor asks her and she confirms it. And at the same time, Lisa's basically saying, yeah, of course I knew this all along because because of course I did, and I didn't tell anyone because Rachel shouldn't know this because it will it will it will push her away from humanity even more than she already is. At least now she's trying, um, but basically that she has, you know, my my way of saying it is that she almost has the neural social circuitry of a dog, and it replaced the neural social circuitry of humans, and she just doesn't get humans at all. Yeah, yeah. I, this is this is incredible. Um, it. it like it does everything a good setup and payoff should do. Like we, I mean, Matt, you and I recorded a whole podcast on how important setup and payoff was to stories. Um, that's our Chekhov's gun podcast. Go check it out. Uh, but anyway, um, <laughs> like, it, like this is just the way it's constructed. Um, you know, with these little hints through these little tiny setups that almost are imperceivable as setups in, in yeah. times and how, how they pay off in such a narratively fulfilling manner. Like it sheds light on everything we've seen in this arc. Um, it sheds light on how Brian, like what we talked about, how Brian learned to deal with Rachel, um, Rachel's ability to read Taylor's body language, um, the reactions to any time anyone would talk to her and try to treat her, like deal with her um, using human context clues. Um, like everything, all, yeah. all these little, these little pieces came together in this one moment that like is so important because it completely redefines how both Taylor and we, the reader, uh, view this character. And it extends beyond this arc too. Like it's perfect within this mini story that arc five is, but then it colors everything else. Um, mm -hmm. it colors, you know, when, when Rachel, uh, attacked Taylor, um, at, at, I think it was arc two. Um, suddenly that makes more sense because she wasn't just doing it to be a jerk. Um, she was establishing dominance as a dogwood. She was protecting her pack. Taylor was not a member of her pack and she perceived it as a, her as a threat and acted accordingly. Um, yeah. everything around with this, sorry, I keep, I keep interrupting you and you try to talk. Well, that's fine. I, I was, I mean, you're, you're, you're actually saying in line with, with, with what I was going to say there. And, and also that Taylor's response to that situation is accidentally exactly the right response because she responds to the the attempted dominance display with her own dominance display and, right, and beats right. down Rachel and then Rachel essentially takes it as like a, okay I'll I'll submit and and doesn't push it any further she you know she just there's there's although Rachel is still unhappy with her presence Rachel doesn't try anything like that again toward her yeah well and it it like even more stuff within the arc that I didn't even think about till now, like Rachel is seemingly uncaring about neuter who's hurt um, because neuter's not part of her pack. And then right. as soon as Taylor directs it back to, well, if we do this, then tattletale or uh Gru could get hurt. Then suddenly Rachel's compliant again, because it's like, there are consequences against people that are in your pack and it just like it all it all makes sense like it, it's so it's so well done like i can't get it like this, i'm i'm nerding out with this this like way to just narratively constructing this stuff it's just so good it's really yeah. really good yeah and and i mean i think uh it, it's it's one it's one of those things that super duper rewards rereads because as i'm hitting all you know of, of course you know in in arc 2 when we were discussing uh Rachel attacking her in the first place, I already knew this context and was able to see in that light at that point in time. And so, you know, this is one reason why this series really rewards rereads. Yeah, I can imagine. Definitely. 
Um, the, the other thing I wanted to point out of this is, is Taylor's reaction to it, I think is really mm-hmm. important too, because um, Taylor has kind of realized suddenly that um, someone out there could have things worse than her. Um, uh-huh. and, it, and, the, and like, I, I, correct me if I'm wrong, but we've seen a lot of different emotions from Taylor and we've seen her specifically feel bad for people. And, but I, I don't think we've really ever felt true empathy from her as like, like a, a true moment of like, there are people that have it much worse off than I do. And, um, and I feel bad for the way you have to live. And I'm kind of thankful for what i have um yeah and and that's that's, that feels like and if i'm wrong someone in the comments let me know but it feels like that's a new emotional growth for her we've seen and i think that's really important you know as she's doing all these (laughs) not good things ripping out people's eyes like it's there's there's two sides of of taylor um literally with her 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 super villain side and her uh just normal person side that we're seeing both grow kind of simultaneously um, and little moments like this, I think, support that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I think I think this discussion of of Rachel's power and its ramifications is another great example of the theme of trauma that we mentioned on a previous episode. And how trauma and people's reactions to it is, is a big thing that's going on here, particularly if you view a trigger event or power as a metaphor for trauma. Because I mean, that makes perfect sense. A, a, the power and the trigger event is literally something that accompanies trauma and Rachel at some point had a worst day of her life and it literally changed her brain and made her incapable of relating to other people and made her think differently from that point on. That's the definition of PTSD. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Yeah. It, it, it like these metaphors work really well. Um, and you know, like I, we, I think we say a lot of good things about this book because we both like it very much. Um, and I, I, I'm like, like my goal here is not to just like, just go on and on about how wonderful the author is. Um, when I see something I don't like, I am not afraid to point it out, but I can't get over, you know, over and over again, like how well this stuff is set up and written considering like the, the the ridiculous time span in which it was done. Um, like I, I can't get over it. Like there are there are things in here there are plot lines there are trails that like had to have been meticulously constructed in such a short amount of time it is mind boggling to me how it was done yeah i mean i think he probably did a lot of um thinking about the story and these characters before he yeah. ever put pen to paper but that doesn't diminish the accomplishment at all in my mind um be- yeah, I mean, because it's really the the intricacy of the of the stuff is what's impressive to me right right yeah. And, and, you know, both you and I write and we know like, like there's so much, like you sit down in front of a blank piece of paper and there's so much hesitation and you tend to like, well, I can't just sit down and do the thing. I've got to think about the thing for right. forever before I'm like, I'm sure I have the thing in my mind and then I can put it down on paper. And this is kind of a, a perfect example of how that's not necessarily true, how you should write. Just, yeah. just write. Right. And yeah. yeah, you can make changes and, and twist things around, but you got to do the thing. Yeah. And in, in, in the book link things I've written, I do sort of continually have to be like, all right, I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to write this scene because I'm kind of in a groove and then I'll, I'll come back and I'll, I'll stitch in the stuff that makes later stuff make sense and serves as good foreshadowing i'll just come back in later and insert that and it's like okay this this is a web serial it was published in installments there was no opportunity yeah, to you can't go back that. and stitch yeah. things in he had to do all this right the first time so that's our that's our weekly gush about wild Bill. <laughs> um, so we move on to the interlude where we get in uh, the head of gregor the snail which is one of the um Fault Lines crew members. I'm not entirely sure why I love Gregor so much from this interlude. He's he's not quite a Xeno mind like we saw in the Brutus chapter, but he does seem a little bit off in a way that's just super charming to me, particularly in the way he speaks. Do you feel that too, or is that just me? No, yeah, he's 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 really charming. Um, I just think like because we're seeing from his point of view, we can as as readers look past 
his outward unappealing nature, his looks. Um, but he just seems like the kind of place who like, he knows where his place is in the world. Um, the place that his looks present for him, he doesn't like it, but he's not going to sit around and complain about it either. He's just, he's just going to, you know, be himself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. It's, it's neat to see inside the head of somebody who's come to terms with being perceived as a monster. Yeah. So in the, in this chapter, he's basically hiring a guy to be an errand runner because he prefers not to have to go out in public for minor errands if he can help it. He goes to a club owned by Fault Line and he goes upstairs where Neuter is selling his neuter goo to get people high, which I think is a funny and, and probably realistic application of a superhero power. Yeah. One of the girls. Definitely. Yeah. One of the girls that neuter is chatting up seems to be interested in Gregor and is, is being all smiley and flirty, but he brushes her off and later explains to Neuter that he suspects that she was a devotee, which he explains as somebody who's attracted to people with disabilities because of the weakness inherent in the disability. Um, and it's it's interesting because Neuter kind of is like, man, you're you're sabotaging yourself. And it's interesting because you're not you, the reader, can't actually be entirely sure if if Gregor was just being pessimistic and maybe maybe he's a bit more pessimistic and uh, and uh, not quite fully come to terms with his uh, monstrosity than he than he tells himself, which yeah. I think is a realistic touch. Yeah, but also like he's he, it's so logical too because he's like. Um... Like, I think Neuter mentions, like, no, she saw something, you know, underneath that she liked about you. And he's just like, she didn't interact with me long enough to actually right. know who I am. So that's not true. Um, yeah. So, yeah, like, I don't know. Like, I liked all this so much. I liked how he talked. I liked how he saw the world. Um, yeah. I actually liked it. Yeah. So he brings uh, sandwiches to Labyrinth and a, freckled, a freckled girl who isn't named. And then he heads up to bring fault line her sandwich and she's doing experiments with her power. And I think that's cool to see. I mean, I'd probably spend most of my time experimenting with my power. If I had one trying to figure out its nature, its limitations, she's testing the Manton effect, which we've heard about before and whether, whether it's a psychological block or something deeper because she can only cut or manipulate inorganic things, but she's mixing up these rods of organic and inorganic material. And then, like not letting herself see which is which and then trying to cut all of them at once. And every time only the, orga only the inorganic ones are cut. So the experiment is in some sense failing and, or, or really it's showing that the Manton effect holds true. And if you don't know uh, what you're looking at. Yeah. I really like this moment too. Um, people just fiddling with their powers. It's cool. Like a lot of, a lot of the other superhero stories that exist out there, the only moments of like characters, fiddling with their powers is like in their origin like they get a power they train on it and then they're just masters of their power and all the uh all the conflict and tribulations they go through from then on are external of their powers it's just them facing different things but like the idea of, of like it's so realistic of course like you're going to constantly be messing with it and learning and improving it there's not just going to be like one moment where you're now expert at what you do um, uh, that's cool and realistic and it's, it's a little fun moment. And it says something again about the, the source of, of these powers. Um, there's something, there's something going on here. There's some reason why this won't seem to work. Um, it doesn't seem to be a rule of just like a physical rule of the universe. It's something else. Right. Right. Because there's nothing, there's nothing magical about, about living matter versus dead matter that, that, that should cause that to happen. Right. Um, so as she's saying this, uh, Gregor basically just tackles her and starts choking her to, to death. Uh, what were you thinking at this point out of curiosity? Yeah, this really surprised me. And, and then it surprised me that it surprised me <laughs> because like, we've only been in this guy's head for a few paragraphs. Um, but then like he was characterized so well in those paragraphs that this felt out of place to me already. And I think mm -hmm. that's like, again, you know, a, a, a symptom of how good the writing is that like, I have a grasp already on who this guy is. So my mind was just like, like what's going on here? What is this? Is this, this can't just be like a paid assassination or a power grab. Like what, what is this? Um, and, and it's, it's just remarkable how quickly that was set up and done. Yeah. And also in the revelation of it, we, we learn 
another piece of information about powers, which is that he was trying to induce a second trigger event in her, which so basically he's we, we learn about the concept of having a second trigger event that even someone with powers, if they're presumably put in a sufficiently tense situation, might actually have another trigger event and maybe maybe their power gains something we don't know we don't we don't know anything about this other than that maybe it's a possibility oh you mean like when like a, a person almost dies and then suddenly finds that their range on their bug power is a little bit a little bit further out than they thought yeah i don't know something like that. that something like something along those lines <laughs> um so he at this point she she pulls out some files she forgives him like immediately which which is actually very endearing like you, you actually buy that she just like well i can't be mad at you if that was why you did it um, he shows him these files about several other monstrous pair humans bearing this mysterious U or C mark. Um, a less monstrous pair human named Shamrock has turned up, who they plan to recruit. They talk about recruiting. And uh, there are also hints in her files that you can buy powers from people who happen to be using the same C or U-shaped logo. Um, uh, and, of course, the guy who posted the blog post about this fact has been murdered so we're getting we're getting deep we're getting deep into the mythology i mean actually i should correct myself we're we're barely scratching the surface of the mythology but but it's it's arc arc uh, five and we're just starting to mention a handful of these very interesting and tantalizing possibilities that are intrinsic in the powers and, and how complicated this is going to be going forward yeah this has me really really excited matt um, you know, everything we've seen so far has been pretty insular on Taylor, which makes sense because she is the protagonist and the grounding force of the entire narrative. But this kind of gives us a glimpse into how the plot is going to expand beyond uh, a very focused tale on her, where it's going to go. Um, you know, I think you wrote this in your review um, that I did go back and read last week, that in most superhero stories, the, the powers themselves are just... Um, a clever metaphor for the conflicts like Magneto, you know, grew up in a concentration camp behind these metal bars and then grows up to find a way to move metal bars with his mind. Um, but that's all they are. That's the power itself is just a metaphor and um, where the powers came from, why they're there are seemingly unimportant to the story. Um, when you start setting up stuff like happened in, in this interlude, it seems very clear that those are going to be central questions of the story. You know, what are the powers? Where did they come from? Why are they here? Why are their limitations the way they are? And I, that's all like really cool. Um, and I'm yep. really excited about like seeing, you know, how these answers impact Taylor herself, what, what they do to her, what they say about her. And I think that's just really cool. Like this is, I think, so this is arc five out of 30. So we're like a sixth of the way through almost. Um, and like, I'm, we're seeing a glimpse of where this is going to go. And I'm just, I'm really excited. Yeah. I mean, if, if anything, it's, it's interesting how long things have stayed so close to the, to the, to the, you know, grounded mundane reality of Taylor's, Taylor's life. And it's taken five whole arcs to even mention some of these things, which I, I feel like, I feel like in a in a lesser story we would have seen this this logo this this U or C shaped logo in like the prologue you know just to just to be like oh don't worry there's gonna be some mysteries it's like no this is very restrained this is very p paced yeah and and I think that's again a advantage of the format um, and I think it's gonna be necessary because. You know, one of the the biggest complaints lobbed against uh, today's superhero film, right, is that uh, we we expand to this world level and we lose stakes. We lose the people we care about because the story gets so big that we get lost in it, and we just don't we don't see the impact and we don't see how it affects our characters by spending as much time as the story did on the ground level with those characters that we care about. We now are able to grow the story out and we are able to balloon it to these higher and higher stakes um, and still keep ourselves grounded in those characters because we we have a really good grasp of who they are, of what they want, of what they need. And that allows us to to keep those stakes as things get worldwide and crazy. Yep, that's that's exactly right. Couldn't have said it better myself. 
So that that was that was that arc. I that that was a great arc. That was a great interlude. We we've covered a lot of ground. We're getting a lot of character development. We're meeting a lot of new characters. The the world is expanding a bit, and and it and it was fun. On top of everything, we always kind of forget to mention that, <laughs> but it's it's really fun. Yeah, I I, I like. I said this already, but I am I am loving this right now, Matt. Like I have so much fun reading this. I have so much fun talking about it. Like this is this is really really good stuff, um, and I hope everyone else is enjoying it as much as I am. Yeah, well, I'm definitely enjoying the opportunity to do this reread. All right, do you want to move on into your speculations for the week? Yeah, let's speculate some stuff. Um, I don't think we can officially formally declare anything closed. I think we're getting really close on that. Uh, that Rachel Taylor best friends forever um, mm-hmm. <laughs> thing, but um, so I'll, I'll leave, I'll leave those open for now. But okay. one of the things um, I was thinking a lot after last week's recording about, you know, my whole uh, long diatribe on Brian's story. Um, and I, you know, I came to the conclusion that as much as I still think the things that I think about what Wildbo is doing by taking these very traditional stories and weaving them into this complex narrative, um, I do. I have decided that I kind of think that Brian's story felt just too neat to me. Like it was uh-huh. just like it was just too like maybe maybe it came off as a story that's been told a, a thousand times before is because it's not Wildbo making up the story; it's Brian. So I've come to the conclusion that I think his story is kind of not true. Um, I'm not saying that the entirety of it is untrue, but I just have a feeling that like he's exaggerating parts or changing parts to make himself look better or something, something to that effect. Okay. That's uh that's, that's good. That's a good prediction. <laughs> you never know what to say to these cause um, you can't, I, you can't I, say anything. Yeah. I, I, uh, man yeah all right next prediction <laughs> <laughs> so the next one is uh taylor's power increase um has something to do with um her body sensing that she was in an in a extremely near death experience um compensated and increased her power in, a, in an attempt to save her life or or get her out of danger um i don't I, I'm not being specific as to exactly what that was or how it was, but whatever whatever is inside her, whatever is in her mind that allows her uh, to do this, whether it's in her genetic code or what have you, um, was aware of this and subconsciously did it. Um, whether the block is herself mentally or not, I have no idea, but that's that's what I'm thinking. Okay. All right. And that's all I got these for are, this week. These are good. This is, this is good stuff. All right. Um, so, so that wraps up Arc Five Hive. I hope everyone enjoyed our discussion and hearing Scott's reactions and speculations. As always, we appreciate your feedback. We're always trying to improve. So, let us know if you have any advice on Twitter, Reddit, as a comment on our DailyPlanetFilms.com webpage, via an email in our Facebook group, or by Carrier Pigeon. We also have a Patreon page, Patreon.com/DailyPlanetFilms which we've updated recently to provide some more clarity on what we're going to be doing with your donations. Um, while you're on Patreon, don't forget to donate to Wildo because he does this for a living. And, uh, and uh, uh, Scott, the last, the last twig chapter was amazing. Just FYI. <laughs> I mean, I mean, it, it generally is, but like he's, he's undermining my soul. Amazing. <laughs> Maybe um, I'll get around to reading that one day. Yeah. I mean, a lot on our plate now. <laughs> yeah, um, we also have some patrons that we were supposed to thank last, last week, Matt, and we forgot to. We put it in the show notes, but we forgot to announce it on the recording. Um, we want to thank Melissa D for her donation, uh, Nick L, and Ace of Diamond. And then we actually had a new one come in just this week, um, which was Rock Skill Sids. I think I said yeah. that right sounds right um, to me yeah so thank you guys so much we really appreciate these donations um as matt said everything every cent of money we get will go back into the podcast and making it better um paying for uh the things that we need to keep it online and going and all this stuff so we really really appreciate that yeah and also the more the more we get the more we can consider like audience participation type events like some kind of uh, fan art contest yeah 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 
Um, so Scott, where can you be found on the internet? I can be found uh, on Twitter at Scott Daily eighty five. That's D A L Y, and also um, where this podcast is found and everything else we do at dailyplanetfilms dot com. Um, you'll see TV reviews, movie reviews, uh, the other podcast episodes we do for different stuff. Everything we do is is found there. Yep. Yeah, I also write for dailyplanetfilms dot com, and um, I can be found on Twitter at more Mail. And if you enjoyed this podcast and would like to listen to some of our other episodes, I would recommend our Daily Planet University series. On this show, Scott and I take a look at some of the more often used tropes and, and rules and conventions in storytelling and screenwriting and discuss what they mean, how they're used, and uh, when they're used improperly. So that's it for this week. See you all next time. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.